origin of the Jewish community in Lebanon is you have to go way, way back in time. I mean, it, if you're familiar with the Bible, <laughs> the stories of the Bible, uh, the Bible takes place in Lebanon, uh, right? And, and so, um, you know, more so than today's Tel Aviv and, and the disputed territories, uh, the Bible is replete with references to Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon, the snows of Lebanon. So, so uh, I argue that, that uh, the Jews of Lebanon, or as they like to be called, the Lebanese Jews, uh, they're biblical. Um, there was Judaism in Lebanon before there were anything else, before Christianity came, before Islam came, before modernity came. Um, so that's from a historical point of view. Uh, in terms of uh, how Lebanese Jews themselves define themselves and, and trace their origins, uh, that's varied. But the great majority of them um, argue uh, that they date back to the uh, Second Temple period, to 70 AD. So after the destruction of the Second Temple, uh, the Jews were expelled uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, naturally, Jerusalem is the focal point of Jewish existence, Jewish life, uh, Jewish identity. They were expelled by the Romans. A lot of them took refuge in the mountains of Lebanon. And you see remnants of this today in the sort of local archaeology of the Lebanese mountain. Um, there are remnants of temples. There are remnants of etchings, carvings um, in, uh, in Aramaic, uh, in Hebrew letters, in Hebrew. Uh, there are also, um, what do you call them, um, uh, places of pilgrimage on Mount Lebanon that are specifically uh, uh, Jewish. And uh, many of the members of the Jewish uh, community uh, of Lebanon that I've uh, interviewed, uh, whether in Lebanon proper, in Israel, or in the diaspora in America and, and, and uh, uh, in Europe, uh, pointed to me uh, places in Lebanon where, as children, they used to go on pilgrimage, on during pilgrimage holidays. They used to go with their families to pay uh, visits to these places that are millennial in terms of uh, years uh, that are significant to Lebanon's Jewish community. After 70 AD, the destruction of the Second Temple, um, and I must apologize for using AD, uh, some historians prefer CE, current era, it means essentially it's the same dating system. The, <laughs> The, the letters change. Um, so the history of uh, the Jews of Lebanon after 70 AD uh, becomes very similar to the history of Jews um, uh, in general. Uh, um, uh, uh, Jewish life uh, becomes um, diasporic and, and it's, it's the history of uh, the Jews in the dispersion, in, in the lands of dispersion. I imagine that although there are no um, concrete documentations of such, I would imagine that they, um, they suffered the same exactions as Jews uh, under Christianity in general, whether in the uh, Western Roman Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so it's an exilic existence. It's an existence as a, uh, a community that's discriminated against, that was, you know, that suffered the exactions of a nascent new religion, Christianity, uh, so they were pretty much ghettoized in the East as they were ghettoized in, uh, in the West. Um, after 1492, the date of the sort of Reconquista, the expulsion of the Jews and, and the Muslims uh, from uh, the Iberian Peninsula, from re-Christianized Spain, um, a lot of the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula would take refuge um, in uh, what was by then the Ottoman Empire, uh, and within those territories, Lebanon was uh, also one of those destinations. Uh, Beirut, Sidon, Byblos on the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, being port cities, were naturally attractive to uh, different communities of Jews who uh, engaged in, uh, uh, in trade. 
Um, and this is reflected in, in some of the names of Lebanese Jewish uh, families who trace their origins uh, to that migration. Um, uh, Lineado is one of those uh, family names, uh, obviously a Latin or Ladino uh, name. Uh, Galante is, is another name, Lebanese Jews who trace their origins to Lebanon four or five hundred years have in their family lore these stories of them coming uh, from the Iberian Peninsula. That's essentially the, the foundation of Jewish life today in modern times in Lebanon, uh, spanning Sephardic, Mizrahi, who argue that they are the original Jews who never left, uh, and uh, Ashkenazi. The history of the Ashkenazi Jews uh, in Lebanon is fairly recent, and it dates to around 1933. This is the rise of Nazism in uh, Germany. And uh, a lot of the Jews of uh, Germany escaping the exactions of uh, the Nazi um, rise to power, uh, they be uh, began immigrating to British Mandate Palestine in the 1930s, and since they were at times restrictions on immigration, the Maronite Church in Lebanon uh, opened the doors of migration of Jews coming from Europe to settle them to Lebanon. And in my book, I speak about uh, correspondence between church leaders, Maronite church leaders in Lebanon, speaking of um, uh, giving plots of land, lending plots of land, or preparing plots of land that belong to the Maronite church in order to temporarily settle uh, German Jews uh, in Lebanon. So that's, you know, I imagine the origin of the, the Ashkenazi presence, but uh, it might have been also uh, uh, going back to an era preceding that. By 1918, um, the Ottomans had unfortunately chosen the, um, the wrong side in, in the Great War. Um, they lost, and in the process they lost uh, um, their holdings, their territories, and the, their empire was uh, dismantled. Uh, and in the East, in its place, uh, were created uh, new states, uh, among them Lebanon. And that is why when I say Lebanon prior to 1918, we're talking about a geographical space, not a state per se. But Lebanon as we know it, like Syria as we know it, like Iraq as we know it, um, did not exist before 1918. So when you speak of Syria or Iraq or Lebanon or even Palestine, the, the jewel of the crown, before 1918, those formations had, had, had no existence. So those came on the heels of the destruction of the Ottoman Empire and the coming of the Anglo-French into the East and the creation of what we call the Mandate System, which was a League of Nations uh, regime established for the region, uh, sort of um, reordered uh, the map of the, the, the Ottoman Empire and created uh, new states. Um, Lebanese Jews uh, looked at the creation of modern Lebanon in 1920 with a great deal of enthusiasm, with a great deal of positivism, because it was viewed at the time, or at least was established at the time by the French, as a confederation of minorities, but also, in a sense, uh, implicitly, a, a home for Near Eastern Christians. Uh, the community that advocated most vociferously the local, let's quote unquote, Lebanese community that advocated most vociferously for the creation of a state of Lebanon or a Republic of Lebanon were Christians, were the Maronite Christians. Um, and uh, what they foresaw was a, a confederation of minorities where they would be dominant. They were already dominant numerically speaking, uh, culturally speaking, but they wanted to be dominant politically speaking and uh, create this, this sort of, as I said, a confederation of minorities where uh, Jews uh, were present, were equal partners uh, to, uh, to the um, uh, Lebanese Christians, Lebanese Muslims, and others, despite the fact that their numbers were very, very modest. I mean, compared to the Maronites, um, 
uh, I would say, uh, out of a total population in 1920 of about 1 million, 1.2 million, uh, the Jews did not constitute more than 3% of the population. Okay, so they're very, very tiny, similar to uh, perhaps the Druze community in Lebanon, which is not the same as the Jews. Um, right? But the Jews played a major role. Uh, given the, uh, the distribution of power in Lebanon, by tradition, uh, the president of the republic uh, had uh, to be a Maronite Catholic uh, Christian. Uh, the speaker of the house was a Shiite Muslim, and the prime minister was a Sunni Muslim. And this is how, um, uh, how uh, uh, the distribution in the parliament uh, was based on this formula. The majority for Christians, uh, the next majority Sunni Muslims, the next majority Shiite Muslims. Um, the Jews of Lebanon <clears throat> had representation based on their numbers, had representation in the Lebanese parliament, they had one representative. But by tradition, given that there were uh, the equal numbers uh, between the Jews and the Protestants in Lebanon, they had the same uh, numerically, they, they were, there was parity between them. Uh, traditionally, the representative of the Jewish community in Lebanon in the Lebanese parliament <laughs> was a, uh, a Protestant Christian rather than um, a Jew. Um, in the 1930s, one of the um, uh, communal representatives of uh, uh, Lebanese Jewry was in a meeting with the uh, 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 president of the Republic of Lebanon, uh, Emil Iddi was his name at the time, uh, he asked him, Mr. President, how, how is it that every community in Lebanon has a representative in parliament except the Jewish community is represented by someone else? So Emil Iddi tells uh, Joseph Farhi, that was the name of uh, the representative, he tells him, Joseph, uh, when you have a Jewish president, and he points to himself, when you have a Jewish president of the republic, why would you ask for a Jewish representative in parliament. Um, uh, this is to illustrate uh, um, not the political representation of the Jews in Lebanon, but the, the, the sort of affinity that Maronite Christians felt towards Jews, uh, Lebanese Jews, and, and vice versa. Of course, the president himself was not Jewish, but, but he had you know, Jewish sensitivities. That, that's you know, the moral of the story. Again, I want to stress that um, Lebanon was, modern Lebanon, it was founded in 1918, was and remains to this day a confederation of minorities. There are 19 different communal groups in Lebanon. When I say communal groups, it's what we refer to here in the West as ethnic groups. They're ethnic groups defined religiously, so we would call them ethno-religious groups. Um, the Jews were one of those ethno-religious groups. They're recognized on Lebanese identity cards. There are national identity cards in Lebanon that define you as a citizen of the State of the Republic of Lebanon. But there's also a line on the bottom of that card that defines your ethnicity. Uh, it's very strange in an American context, but very common in the Middle East and very common also in Europe. I mean, this is one thing, one of the um, points of contention that Greece had upon, uh, you know, uh, entering the European Union. In Greece, you have that line also that defines you as a Greek Orthodox, not in terms of religion, but all your ethnicity, a Greek Orthodox. Lebanon is likewise. So there are 18, 19 of those um, communities recognized legally uh, with rights and responsibilities like, like any other citizen. Um, but the Jews were among the smallest, as I mentioned uh, before. Um, that number, however, swelled. So I would say among the sw smallest, you know, into the uh, 19, uh, 1930s, 1940s, into the 1950s, the numbers hovered around 10, 15,000. Uh, Jews out of a population of about a million. 1947, 1948, after the UN uh, resolution in 1947 for the 
division of British Mandate Palestine uh, into an Arab state and a Jewish state. A Jewish state was established. We know what happened. The only place after 1948 outside of Israel, the newly established state of Israel, that witnessed a, a, a surge in, uh, a demographic surge in the number of Jews uh, outside of Israel was Lebanon. So from a population of 12 to 15,000 Jews in Lebanon in 1948, after 1948 that number almost doubled to 25,000 by some accounts. And I, you know, I, I'm very ambiguous in terms of numbers here because there are no censuses in Lebanon. As I explained before, it's, you know, a confederation of minorities where the Maronites were chief among those minorities. The last census that was taken was in 1933. It showed the Maronites as a majority. The Maronites decided a, a very sort of um, a brittle, weak majority. The Maronites decided no more censuses will be taken. We are the majority now. We're going to keep the numbers at 1933. Um, so they stopped taking censuses. That's why when I speak in terms of numbers, we base them on, you know, what you call uh, in Hebrew, uh, hatch, batch, and dispatch. So we, 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 uh, we account for those numbers based on the numbers of registered births within the community, the numbers of registered, uh, uh, so this is the hatch, the number of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, hatch, batch is the numbers of marriages and dispatch, the numbers of uh, burials. So based on essentially the numbers that we get from uh, synagogues, those are the numbers that, that we're dealing with. So 1948 from about 12 to 15,000, the numbers of Jews in Lebanon swelled to about 25,000. Uh, um, this is largely attributed to the fact that uh, a lot of the Jews of Arab lands who were expelled or left from what became Syria, Iraq, Egypt, um, some from North Africa, places that were no longer as hospitable to Jewish life as the case might have been before, chose uh, instead of further diaspora further west into Europe, which a lot of you know Syrian Jews or Iraqi Jews did end up uh, uh, in Europe and the Americas, rather than choosing Israel, they chose Lebanon. And that is on account of many factors, um, economic factors at times, but familial factors also. A lot of you know, Damascene Jews, Jews of Damascus, Aleppo Jews, Jews of Aleppo, Baghdadi Jews, uh, Jews of Baghdad, um, had either family members already well established, old family members in Lebanon, namely in the mountains in Lebanon, and, but, but also in the port cities uh, of Beirut and Sidon, but also had commercial interests in Lebanon. So they chose, uh, um, you know, familiar climes, if you will, places where, you know, they had family, they had business connections, uh, and chose Lebanon instead of Israel and, and uh, other places. So that explains uh, the swell in the numbers. Um, over time, uh, the um, exercise and power sharing in Lebanon between Christians uh, and Muslims uh, got disrupted. Uh, because of many factors, uh, the creation of the uh, Arab uh, refugee problem after the establishment of the State of Israel. A lot of those Arabs of British Mandate Palestine, about 300,000 of them, uh, ended up in Lebanon. They were in their majority uh, Sunni Muslims. Um, they disrupted the confessional balance in Lebanon, and over time, uh, because they were fighting a war against Israel and fighting it from, Le from Lebanese territory, uh, they began sort of building a state within uh, the Lebanese state. They were no longer relegated to refugee camps. They were sort of, you know, uh, uh, spreading their power around. And over time, this uh, etiolated, uh, you know, Lebanese sovereignty. 
and it exploded in conflagration in the early 1970s, culminating in uh, the Lebanese Civil War, what we call Lebanese Civil War, which began initially between uh, Lebanese Christians and PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, members in 1975. Uh, and that war would last into uh, the late 1980s. Uh, so this uh, caused also um, a great waves, successive waves of uh, Jewish uh, migration out of Lebanon. Between 1976, from 1976 to 2004, Syria was uh, in control of, of Lebanon. So this, you know, uh, affected very negatively um, life in general in Lebanon, but, you know, the most visible community is usually the smallest community, the most vulnerable one. Um, there were instances of uh, harassment, kidnappings, killings of uh, Jewish communal leaders in Lebanon. Um, a lot of the Jews in Lebanon, uh, those who chose not to immigrate and leave the country, uh, ended up, you know, opting for living quietly. Um, today, um, you can count them on a few fingers, a couple of hundred uh, members of the community remain. Those who were willing to speak as Jews to me, off the record, of course, uh, they live as crypto Jews, essentially. Uh, a lot of them uh, marry into Christian families. They raise their children as, as Christians. Uh, you know, they keep some elements of uh, Judaism, but in, in the political cl climate of Lebanon today, it's um, not easy uh, being a Jew. Um, so they, they get their schooling in Catholic schools. They you know, marry into Christian families. They, they become part of you know, the dominant uh, Christian community of Lebanon. Uh, those are the ones who opted not to emigrate. But I would say what's left of Lebanese Jewry is at most 200 people. Incidentally, however, the Jews who have left, uh, especially those, those I have interviewed who lived in the United States, who lived uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe, who do not have family in Israel or who do not visit Israel on a regular basis uh, can return to Lebanon. They make pilgrimage, some of them almost once a year they return to Lebanon because their passports are clean, so to speak. They haven't been to Israel. Those who have family in Israel um, and visit Israel and their family regularly it's, it's very moving speaking to them, and I've met many of them in Israel proper. Uh, brings tears to your eyes because they say they, some of them tell me, uh, you know, even though it's been 50, 60 years since they've left Lebanon, and those are, you know, old timers. Um, one of them uh, tells me, I, I dream of Lebanon. I still dream of Lebanon. And they go to Israel um, to be... Um, to be in what they called in, in, uh, in, in, in some of my meetings with them, what they called a nearness out of reach. They're so close to Lebanon, they can smell it, they tell me, but they can't. They can almost make out the contours of it. They go to areas of the border just to look at the landscape, but they, they can't go. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's in a lot of ways this book um, began initially as as um, um, as a you know documentation a, a, a research based and it is a research based uh, book. I uh, I did a lot of work at the Alliance Israelite Universelle in in Paris, reading in the archives there, uh, the Holocaust Museum in D.C. Um, uh, but also here at BC, uh, the the library was able to get me a very, very nice, very rich collection of uh, newspapers, um, uh, Jewish newspapers from Beirut that were published in Beirut from 1920 into 1967. This is when one, one of those, those journals uh, called Al-Alam al-Israeli, the Israelite universe, uh, 
uh, published in Arabic in Beirut, ceased publication in 1967. So I work with those uh, newspapers to uh, to sort of uh, provide the, the the foundation to the first uh, section of uh, the book, which which dealt with the history of Lebanese Jewry in the 20th century. And the second part of the book is just personal recollections, recollections of Lebanese Jews, whether in Lebanon proper or in the diaspora, in Israel, elsewhere in the United States, in Europe, but also recollections of other Lebanese and how they remember uh, Lebanese Jews. Um, so this section is in a lot of ways also personal because um, I um, sort of intrude on it with, with my own uh, recollection. So the, 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 some sections of it, of the personal recollections of non-Jewish Lebanese includes my, uh, my own recollections. Um, and the reason I embarked on, on this research project um, like most historical research, usually one uh, book leads to another, or one research or something you encounter in, in, in the process of researching, one topic leads to something else. So, so, so in the process of researching my first book, Language, Memory, and Identity in Lebanon, I happened upon uh, a, a very rich uh, 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 private archive uh, that has had not been explored before that led me to my second book, which was an intellectual biography of a um, Lebanese nationalist of um, um, the first half of the 20th century. Um, and in the process of reading his private papers, I encountered um, uh, correspondence uh, this person, I should, I should uh, preface by saying uh, that uh, he was a poet, he was a, um, um, he was a playwright, uh, he was a patron of the arts, but he was also an, an industrialist. He introduced uh, Ford Motors into the Levant, and he had dealerships uh, all over the Levant, among them uh, in uh, British Mandate Palestine, in Jerusalem, and in Haifa. Uh, and naturally, he traveled a lot to visit his different uh, showrooms and so forth, um, and uh, had very tight commercial and, and personal connections uh, to the peoples of the Yishuv, to, uh, to Persians in Persia, to Iraqis in Iraq. This is, you know, where his, to Turks. Uh, so I found in his uh, correspondence um, uh, elements relative to uh, the pre-state Israel relative to uh, uh, the Christians of Lebanon, the Jews of Lebanon. That's what led me into uh, researching the Jews of Lebanon. Um, but I feel that also this, this is a book that I perhaps wanted to write all my life. Uh, having grown up in, uh, in Beirut in a very diverse cosmopolitan uh, port city uh, where you could hear, you know, languages uh, spanning French and Arabic and Armenian and Hebrew and, and, and English uh, and Turkish, a place where it was not unusual to, you know, have a very good uh, sauerkraut at, at a local restaurant, as good as the hummus at the other local restaurant. So it was a very diverse place. Uh, I always had this curiosity about the Jews within that hodgepodge of Armenians and Arabs and Turks and Circassians and Americans and Frenchmen and so forth. Um, and part of the reason for that was um, not necessarily social, uh, but personal. Uh, we had a neighbor um, uh, who was Jewish, uh, you know, as, as a young, as a child, I didn't know who was Jewish and who was not. Um, but this neighbor in particular, I came to find out later that she was Jewish, um, not because uh, of her presence, but because of her absence from the apartment that was uh, in our building. 
she would come and visit the apartment um, uh, very often to aerate the apartment, open it, turn the lights on once a week perhaps. But other than that, the apartment was dark. Uh, I knew that her husband was deceased, so she was a widow. Uh, and that scared me as a seven, eight-year-old, you know, coming back from school, walking up the stairs, going through the first flight, hello to the neighbor who lived on the first flight, second flight, third flight of stairs was completely dark. So I always ran by that first flight of stairs. It, the, you know, there was something, a combination of it being dark, empty, the house of a dead man, and later I found out that this dead man was Jewish. What is Jewish? And I grew up, I got to be 18, I was uh, prepping for my high school exit exam in Lebanon. This is a very important exam, the baccalaureate, the baccalaureate. This essentially decides the rest of your life based on your results in this exam. Uh, it's decided whether you go to college or not, what kind of college you go to, etc. So you have about a five week um, of cramming for the exam. Usually you went up into the mountains, isolated yourself from people, and sort of studied the last three years of high school in order to go for a week and take exams in different uh, disciplines. And during that period, I was struck by my mother coming uh, to visit me in my mountain retreat at the time with a basket of dry fruits and nuts, saying, here, this is for you to eat and gather your strength so that you can cram. And this is from our neighbor, Hanayni. That was her name, our Jewish neighbor. I said, gee, that's, you know, that's, that's very nice of her, she, uh, I said. Then my mother said, yeah, and in addition to that, she just told me that uh, she started a novena on your behalf. You know what a novena is? Novena is a, uh, you know, a typical Catholic uh, sort of ritual of praying nine days or nine nights in a row to a particular saint. And it's something that Catholics do, that, you know, Christians do. And I was profoundly moved by, by what m my mother had told me about our Jewish neighbor, um, you know, be, being... Uh, so interested in how I do in this exam that she would feed me, bring me food, you know, what we call today, you know, what is it, power, power bars, you know, dried fruits and nuts, but also a Jewish woman who would start a novena prayer to the Virgin Mary on behalf of the child of her Maronite neighbors. Um, and that I think that I think was the, the the personal starting point for me as you know beginning to to wonder ask questions you know what is you know who am I what am I what is my identity in Lebanon and who are the others and what is Jewish and why is this Jewish woman uh, engaging in this Christian ritual and that's you know that's also an illustration of of the diversity of Lebanon, of the, you know, crossing, uh, you know, ritualistic and, and, and cultural and religious barriers and sort of, you know, moving back and forth and, and, and uh, uh, borrowing from other people's uh, uh, traditions. Another personal story that, that speaks to the, 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 the personal, um, The personal aspects of, of the, this uh, project and, and the, the final product, uh, the book, um, is uh, a Lebanese Jewish family that, I, that lives in Mexico that I've been communicating with uh, for a while, uh, mainly uh, uh, the wife, um, who's just about my age. Um, whose husband I had never met, but I'd heard about. And I finally met him uh, in Israel, in, um, in Tel Aviv, in 2016, the summer of 2016. Uh, we, were, you know, we were supposed to meet at a certain place and walk over to a restaurant and have dinner. 
because essentially I wanted, there was a story that I speak about in, in the book uh, relative to this person's wife with whom I had been communicating. I wanted to learn about her father who essentially was tortured by the PLO during the 1970s and ultimately died in exile. Uh, so I wanted to get that story. But in the process, uh, wanted to meet uh, her husband. Fadi is her name, uh, his name. And I met Fadi, and she introduced me to him, and I'm shaking his hand, and I'm looking into his eyes, and he's looking into my eyes. And it's, you know, there was an eerie feeling as if, you know, we had, you know, you know the feeling you have when you see someone and you recognize the face, the face looks very familiar, the eyes speak to you, but you can't recall where you've met that person. It's a déjà vu, I guess, it's called, you know, I couldn't recall his name, he couldn't recall my, we didn't want to be impolite to each other, but it's as if I knew him. And later, after speaking with him, he had that same feeling. So it turned out we went to the same school in Lebanon, okay, to the same high school. Um, he went few years, he graduated few years uh, before me, uh, but we walked the same grounds. We, we ate in the same dining halls. Um, uh, he boarded at the school. I uh, commuted. Uh, but it's, I, I found it eerie, insane, refreshing uh, to have never met this person, but yet felt as if I'd known him all my life and instead of spending dinner speaking with his wife and getting the story about her father I spent my time with him remembering our old school days and he told me you know back in the time when I lived in Lebanon and they left um, on the heels of 1967 1967 1968 right after the the, uh, uh, the 1967 Arab Israeli war uh, things were beginning to become difficult for them. They were being harassed, etc. So they opted to leave and they, they left to Mexico. He said, you know, the days I lived in Beirut, in Lebanon, you know, I used to have friends, Muslim friends, Christian friends, but he said, especially my Christian friends would tell me things to the effect that, you know, as, as a Christian, I cannot truly be Christian without first being Jewish. In any case, this kid you know, my age, probably a few years older than I, um, who's very youthful, who still speaks very positively in spite of, you know, what they had suffered uh, of Lebanon, still yearns for Lebanon, uh, uh, remembers his, uh, he boarded at a Catholic school. Um, he remembers most fondly or with a great deal of frustration at times uh, four or five o'clock in the morning uh, when uh, the, the school, uh, his, his floor's priest used to come to wake him up in the morning, four thirty, five o'clock in the morning. He would be, you know, gent he, that's the story he told me, he would be shaking him gently, Fadi, Fadi, my son, get up. It's time for your prayer. Imagine that. I mean, and this is the Lebanon that I speak about in the book, you know, this Lebanon of diversity and multiplicity, and this is Jewish Lebanon that I speak about in the book. You have this priest whose job is to convert Fadi, not to wake him up early in the morning and push him to, to do his Jewish duty, you know, do the morning prayer. Um, so this is something that, that um, that is very moving, very representative of Lebanon that is no longer Lebanon. Today, Lebanon is very different. But still, it's, it's a Lebanon that Lebanese Jews have kept etched in their memories.